How's everybody doing today? Come on. This many people in the house, and that's all we get? That's much better. I'm having some wiring problems. My name is Billy P., for those of you that don't know me, and uh, I'm a recovering drug addict and a recovering alcoholic, and more important than that, I'm a true soldier of the Lord. I want to welcome everybody. Traditional uh, church, or you're used to the way you think things are supposed to be. Uh, Good luck with that, because that's not how we do it here. (laughs) You know, when I was asked to come here and speak, I didn't know what I was going to talk about, and I'm glad, because remember, my name is Billy P, and I'm a recovering drug addict and recovering alcoholic. If you really want me to come here and speak to you about what I know. You wouldn't benefit from it. You really wouldn't. And that's why when people say, Billy, man, what are you going to talk about? Well, I don't know, but I tell you what, man, I sure am excited to see what God's going to talk about. I sure am excited to see what God's going to do in this building today. And I am not a person that's going to tell you, hey, God spoke to me and God told me this. I'll be honest with you. If I ever hear God, I'm going to have to go to the seventh floor because I'm going to trip out. I'm not going to understand it. What I will tell you is God puts things on my heart, and I'm obedient enough today because I understand what obedience is, and I'm humble enough today to just simply do it because I know that that's what he wants me to do. The Good Samaritan, we go to Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37, and behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, teacher, What shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this, and you will live. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed him on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, he who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just ask that you just remove me of myself and fill me with the Holy Spirit. Lord, I ask that you just give us the eyes to see what you want us to see. Father, I ask you to give us the ears to hear your message, Lord. Father, let you be in this room and let us get wisdom and knowledge and the courage to go out and be neighbors. I ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. People, when we read that, there's a lot of different ways that we can take that. When I was growing up, I went to a private Catholic school, kindergarten through eighth grade. And I am not only a recovering addict and a recovering alcoholic, I am a recovering Catholic. You see, when I went to this school, I had the best education that money could buy. Top of the line education. There was no arguing about what we were going to wear to school because it was going to be the same. It was going to be a shirt, white, blue, a pair of pants, and always a tie. But one thing that they never, never taught me was about God's grace. By the time I ended eighth grade, I knew I was going to hell. And let me tell you something, that is not a real pleasant feeling to have being an eighth grader. 
If I'm going to hell, I left eighth grade going into high school with the mentality of this. If I'm going, I'm going to take as many of y'all with me as I possibly can. And I did. I ran that way for 20 years of my life. And this is where it ended up leading me. I started experimenting with drugs and alcohol at the age of 12. I started messing with Satan and working for Satan at the age of 12. I stopped learning at the age of 12. I stopped knowing anything at the age of 12. I that I knew all the answers and everybody else was wrong. I did everything possible to try to fill this void inside of me. I got high and I ran the wrong road for 20 years of my life. I've spent 16 years of my life owned by the state of Michigan, MDOC, people that is not the bus transportations. I am a four-time convicted felon. And at the end of my run, when I thought I had all the answers, I ended up leaving Flint and I made this geographical change. And what I did is I went to Detroit. <laughs> you can laugh because that's not a great change. I go from Flint to Detroit thinking things are going to get better. Now at this time, I'm pretty mad at God. I don't even understand God. And I remember wandering down the streets of Warren Avenue. And I remember just a wreck. At this time in my life, I'm living in a tent in the alleys off of Warren Avenue, and I'm eating out of dumpsters. And I remember wandering up and down that road of Warren Avenue, and I remember crying out, and I remember saying, what about me? You guys are all telling me how great God is, and I'm sitting there saying, what about me? God, is this really what you've got in store for me? Don't I fit in? I'm not in this great plan that I hear everybody talking about. And I don't know what it took, but finally the process for me on November 11, 2004, I found myself doing something really profound. I found myself going into a small around. chapel. See, I'm looking around because I don't want anybody to see me what I'm about to do because I didn't even know what I was about to do. I go into this chapel and for the first time in my life, man, I hit my knees. And when I got down on my knees, I cried. And when I cried, I asked for help. And see, remember, I'm a recovering Catholic. Okay, I'm waiting to see some signs, people. I'm waiting to see a dove fly by me in this building. Or I'm waiting to see a light shine through the windows. I'm waiting to hear, whoa, I'm waiting for a sign, something. There was no light come through the windows. It was probably very overcast that day. There are absolutely no birds inside of that building. And I didn't hear anything. But for the first time, in 32 years of my life, in the 20 years that I was putting everything that this world had to offer me in my body, I had a warmth come over me. For the first time in 20 years of my life, I had a feeling come inside of me that did not come from a needle. It didn't come from a bottle. I didn't buy it on the streets. You can't order it at the bar. And you know what? For the first time in my life, I knew. I knew I was going to be okay. Did I know at the time what was in store for me? Absolutely not. I had no idea. But I knew for the first time in my life, I was done. I know for the first time in my life, I understood the word surrender. That was November 11, 2004. For the past six and a half years now, I have been serving God. I have been obedient to God. I have been doing everything that he puts on my heart to do. I have been called, you're a Jesus freak. I have been called, you're one of those crazy God-loving people. Let me tell you something, people. Is that not better than a junkie or a crackhead? Yeah! You call me a Jesus freak all you want because I love it. I don't just say it, I love it. I got a smile on my face today. I got a twinkle in my eye today that I tell you what, this world could not give me because if it could, I would have bought it. If it could, I would have found it. It's given to me by the Lord. And when I read this parable that Jesus talks about, about the Good Samaritan, we think to ourselves, well, you know what? That's kind of rude of this priest to just walk by. But the reality is, is the priest was suffering from self-righteousness. You see, back then, the priest was doing what the priest thought he was supposed to do. 
Back then, the priest isn't supposed to put his hands on a dead person. Now, I have to be taught this, okay? I do go get taught. If you think I got the answers, you're wrong. I don't. But I tell you what, I'm humble enough today, and I know the, I know the definition of being humble. I know how to ask for help. I know how to ask, hey, could somebody explain this to me, please? Because I don't want to figure it out myself because I'm going to be wrong. I thought the priest walked by because he just simply walked by. And then the Levite comes around. The same thing holds true for the Levite. Levite has no business placing his hands on a dead person. That's why they walk to the other side. But if we read the way that it's written, the priest and the Levite were simply just out wandering around. They had no appointment to go to. They weren't on their way anywhere. They were simply just walking around. And they came across this man laying on the road. Then the Good Samaritan. And the way we read it and the way that it's written tells us that this Good Samaritan is actually on a journey. Which tells us that this Good Samaritan actually has a destination. This Good Samaritan is actually going to do something that he's set out to go do. And who would have thought, back then, a Samaritan, which they classify as the low life of society, the castaways, the nobodies, the people you just don't even want to mess with. I mean, let's face it, the Jews back in the day when they had to travel, they would actually go hundreds of miles out of their way to not even pass through Samaria. They're walking, folks. We don't even like to go five miles out of our way, and we got four wheels and a motor underneath the hood. These people are walking, man, and they don't even want to go there, so they're walking all that extra space to get out of there. Go figure, it's a good Samaritan that comes by. And the way we read it, it's that good Samaritan looks at this individual who has fallen to thieves with compassion. With compassion. Now, the way it's worded in the way that we understand it, this Samaritan, if we're back then, is a low life, is a menace to society, will never amount to anything, is somebody that we simply want to stay away from. Then could you explain to me why this Samaritan looked down with compassion? You see, I walked the way of that Samaritan did. I was a low life. I was a menace to society. I did seek and destroy everything that came in touch with me. Not because I wanted to, but because the enemy, I fell into the grips of the thieves. Are you following me here? The thieves does not have to be a person. You don't think the streets and the disease of addiction and the disease of alcoholism grabbed me, beat me down, left me naked, took everything that I had? You ask my wife, she'll guarantee you that it did all those things to me. And as I'm wandering the streets of Warren Avenue, you know how many priests and Levites walked around me? I'll bet you the number is thousands and thousands. You know how many Samaritans came up to me? A few. Probably a lot more than I can remember because of where I was at. But back then, man, apparently I didn't feel enough pain. Back then I still was suffering myself from self-righteousness. And I ask myself, how many of us suffer from that still today? I bet you the answer, we really don't even want to know. And that's honesty. I preach, man, all over the United States. I speak in so many places, it's unreal. And I hear things like this. Billy, what you said really offended me. Billy, uh, I don't think you have a right to say that. Let me tell you something. If you think that Billy P is that important, you're wrong. I guarantee you, it ain't Billy P that made you feel uncomfortable. I guarantee you, you might want to take that up with God. You might want to ask yourself if for the first time you felt a little bit of conviction and leave Billy P right out of the equation because he simply just isn't that important. Nothing I'm going to say is going to offend you. It's what we've done. It's what we still do. I will never get on a pulpit and tell you that I got this stuff figured out. I won't. I will tell you this, though. This book right here, this book is everything that I need. 
This book right here has given me everything that I absolutely need. I know that this book is truth. I know that this book is life. I know that this book teaches me how to be the husband that my wife deserves. I know this book teaches me how to be the father that all of them kids need and deserve. I know that this book teaches me about God, the true God, my strong tower, my savior, the God of gods, the Alpha and the Omega, everything that there is, people. I know that it is life. I know that it is salvation. I know that this right here is all that I need to become the person that I was intended to be all along. I don't need none of that religion. I don't need none of that man-made garbage that I was fed for quite a few years of my life. I don't want none of that. You know why? Because it's useless. I ran with that stuff. You know where it got me? It got me to a point where I didn't even want to live. It got me to a point where I didn't know nothing about life. It got me to a point where I was existing. That's it existing. And then on November 11th, 2004, I started this journey. A journey I didn't even think I was worthy of. A journey that I was scared of. A journey I didn't even know where it was going to take me. When I left that building, I first group of Samaritans not one. My God is so good, and my God is so great. He didn't send me one Samaritan. He sent me a whole group of Samaritans, and when they showed up, I actually had clarity in my mind. I actually knew what love was about, and these people showed up, man, and they happened to come from the point, and they loved me, and they picked me up, and they cleaned my wounds. They wrapped me, They comforted me and they cared for me. They didn't say nothing about how crazy I looked. They didn't say nothing about the words that were coming out of my mouth. For the first time in my life, I was shown unconditional love. And for the first time in my life, I was able to receive it. You see, if I told you I stopped learning at the age of 12, I did. I had to go out and buy a dictionary. I had to buy a dictionary at the age of 32. I couldn't go steal it because I'm not supposed to live like that no more. I couldn't go to the library and check it out with the understanding I'm never going to bring it back. I had to go buy a book. You know the book I bought? I had to buy a dictionary. And here's some humility. I looked up simple words. Simple words like love. Simple words like kindness. Simple words like truth, honesty, peace, serenity. Things that are so simple that a lot of us take for granted and some of us never even know what they mean. Because it took me 32 years to understand what any of that meant. What I got out of it, priceless. Was it one Samaritan? No, it's a lot of Samaritans. Today I live a life that I didn't even think it was possible. Today I live a life that is easy. It's easy when I come home. It's challenging when you fight that good fight. Let's face it. We come in here on Sundays and we get what we want for us. Some of us come in here and, you know, we get all dressed up in our Sunday and we go clothes. Home. And do we really want to know the number of the people that are going home? and twisting the top off of a bottle, being nasty to their neighbors, speaking to their families the way they just ought to not speak to them. And then they come back on Sunday, and they want to compare the Joneses to them, and they want to act like they got it going on. People, is that really what we want? Is that our job? Not. You see that smile I got? Do you see that? You see that twinkle in my eye? You want some of that? Come get it. You want to know what I do? I give it out to everybody and I invite them to come get some. You are not going to see me any different on this pulpit, on that bike, mowing my lawn, at work, talking to anybody out in society, at the gas station, at the bank. What you see is what you get. I am done living the life of a chameleon because I told you, I know who God is. I know the true God of true gods. I know that God took all that stuff and threw it away. 
I know that on November 11, 2004, I became a new creation. You know who I please? I please God. You know why? Let me let you know something, people. When God is smiling on me, my wife is smiling on me. When God is smiling on me, my kids want to be around me. When God is smiling on me, I don't have a worry in the world. I don't worry about finances. Why? What's that going to do? I've had all kinds of money in the past, only to spend it on garbage. Materialistic things don't mean a thing to me. I went 24 months not long ago with no income coming in my house. Nothing. We have four of the most magnificent kids, man, that parents could ever even ask for. They're not my kids. They're God's kids. This guy says, who is my neighbor? Come on, people. Why? You know what I want to ask? I don't want to ask who's my neighbor. I know who my neighbor is. Ask how can I be a better neighbor? I want to ask, what can I do to make me a better neighbor? The answer is pretty simple. Get out of yourself. Get out of your selfishness. Get out of your self-wants and your self-desires. And simply allow God to do something inside of you that nobody else can ever do. And you can't go buy it anywhere. I know that for a fact because I tried. I know that I'm in it to win it. I know that my creator... I know that my strong tower, I know that my deliverer, I know that my teacher, I know that my good shepherd, I know that he is the way. I know that he knows I'm done. I'm done. I quit getting high and ripping and roaring one time, November 11, 2004. Now, I go to a lot of meetings, and they're self-help meetings, and I love my meetings. Don't get me wrong. On November 11, 2004, when I told God, man, you know what? I will serve you. I will do whatever you ask me to do. Even if I don't understand it, I'm simply going to do it. I will continue to figure out what the next right thing for the right reason is. I'm not using no more. I have not had to go out and test the waters again. I don't have to. For what? To exist again? To simply exist? I look at this priest and I look at this Levite And I wonder, I wonder whatever became of them. Most importantly, I look at the Samaritan. And then I look at the guy who fell to the thieves. And I'll bet you that guy that fell to the thieves, because enough pain and enough situations, I'll bet you that that guy that got left for the thieves turned around and did some amazing things to serve God. I'll bet you he went around with a smile like this. I'll bet you he went around with a twinkle in his eye. I'll bet you he knows how to be a good neighbor. I'll bet you he isn't even wondering who his neighbor is. I'll bet you he understands that your neighbor can be a person with a six-digit salary from a blue-collar worker to a hobo to somebody living on the park bench to anybody. It isn't who is our neighbor. We're all neighbors, people. Come on. That's what the Word of God tells me. Remember I had to buy a dictionary? That dictionary helped me out a whole lot. A whole lot. I didn't even understand what a good neighbor even was. I really didn't. I don't care what people say about me. If you think I care what anybody thinks or says about me, you are absolutely wrong. You with me? I surely didn't care what you thought when I was panhandling the corners of Detroit. I surely didn't care what you thought when I was crawling through your house window to take your appliances. Do you really think I care what people say about me today? You remember? I know this parable. I was that. I was the guy who fell to the thieves. It did beat me down. It did leave me for dead. It did take everything that I had, and the things that it didn't take, it had me so tight, I gave my things away to it. I didn't lose my family, I gave my family away. The only thing I couldn't give away is my best friend, my wife. Remember that dictionary? I had to figure out, man, what a wife even was. I had to figure out how a man is supposed to treat his wife. I had to figure out what a man is supposed to do. All them years I'm out there thinking I had all the answers and I thought I was the man. I didn't even know what a man was. You talk about humility? Try at the age of 32, man, to figure out what a man is. 
try at the age of 32 how to figure out how you are supposed to have been treating. Besides God's grace, that's the next biggest blessing that he's ever given me. These five children, I told you they're not mine, they're God's kids. He gave them to me on loan, me and my wife, for us to do the best that we can to raise them, to raise them biblically, to teach them about things that this world is not going to teach them, like trust, honesty, family values, morals, self-respect, worth. This world ain't going to teach you that. I'll promise you that. I've been a part of that world for a long period of my life. You know what it taught me how to do? Lie, steal, cheat, hurt, and hide. That's what the world gave me. After everything that I handed over to the world, it gave me those. People, those are not the ingredients, man, of success. Those are not the ingredients of the recipe that God has given to me. And I had to come around and figure that out. I really did. I'm not saying everybody that's coming in here is this priest and this Levite. I've got solid brothers and sisters that know Jesus. They know he's the redeemer. They know he's the strong tower. They know that he is the good shepherd. Come on. That excites me. That is something all of us need to be excited about. I know about. the reality. I don't walk around with horse blinds on. Remember, I'm a dope fiend alcoholic named Billy P. I got my hand out to so many people, it's crazy. So many people fall into the thieves, it's crazy. I'm not the Samaritan that just walks by and bandages them up. I'm a crazy Samaritan that comes by and drags them to scoop them up to make sure that they know that people care about them. And I plant that seed. Hey, man, they're like, Billy, man, you're a crazy dude, man. You sure seem to be happy all the time. Why is that? i tell you what, convictions, I've been convicted many times in my life, but it was always by a man in a black robe. And I was never innocent. For some reason, it took what it took, but I figured out not only am I a failure at drinking and drugging, I am a complete failure at breaking the law. They seem to catch me sooner or later. I've never sat in a building and said, I'm innocent. I always sat and said, oh, here we go again. It'll be different next time. It ain't no different next time, man. If nothing changes, nothing changes. In other words, if we don't do something, we're going to continue to see empty seats. Does that make sense? It's not tough arithmetic. If you are a closet Jesus freak, I am going to pray for you. If you come here and you get what you want for you and you go home and you keep it only for you and your family, I always do pray for you because I'm sorry. You want to be a true soldier of the Lord? You don't want to go out and fight that good fight? It takes courage and it takes strength and it takes blind faith and you just simply got to do it. And when you do it, watch the things that happen. Money means nothing to me, absolutely nothing. The two years that I didn't have an income into my family, let me tell you something. Did I stop doing what I do? Absolutely not. Did I think about doing some real foolish things? Oh, absolutely. I suffer from the disease of self-inflicted retardation, and he's known as Billy P. Wherever I go, Billy P shows up. He's always there, and he's always trying to throw something in there. If you think the enemy ain't powerful, I'm here to tell you he is. If you think the enemy's not a good fisherman, I'm here to tell you he is. That enemy knows me so well, he has about six tackle boxes with every lure, man, that I like in it. I cannot be hungry. He will throw something in my path. He knows the right color. He knows the right scent. He knows the right bling bling to make me want to bite on it when I'm not even hungry. Now, if that's not a good fisherman, would somebody tell me what one is? Because I love fishing just as much as Pastor Jim does. I'll promise you that. Ask my wife. That's a good fisherman. Is he better than Jesus? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. 
I look at the society that we live in and it kills me. And you know why it kills me? Because I think that a lot of people suffer from what I suffer with. I think a lot of people don't have the right person to explain to them that a long time ago in the book of Matthew, Jesus came into town. And when JC showed up, I'm pretty sure he went down and he kicked the enemy square in the mouth. And you know what he did? He pulled out a pair of keys and he dangled those keys in front of him and he said, absolutely no more. You got absolutely nothing on my children anymore. Nothing, people. Did we forget that? You see, if we didn't forget it, then we ought to be spreading it. If we didn't forget it, there's a lot of people who don't know that. And if they don't know that, they're the ones that are hurting. They're the ones that have no idea. They're the ones that don't even understand that Jesus is the reason why the enemy has nothing on us. But we allow it. We fall short. It's like the word of God says. We fall to flesh. And when we fall short and we allow that enemy one inch, the next thing you know, it becomes a yardstick. One inch becomes a yardstick. People say, Billy, man, how you got so much trust in God? Uh, you, you ever read this? Uh, you ever read what's in this? You ever ask somebody, man, to sit down with you and say, hey, I'm new. Right now, man, I can't even handle milk. Will you guide me through this? Will you answer so many uncertainties, man, that I just don't have? And watch, that's when you find out you're true soldiers. Because they're going to say, of course I will. Let me clarify that for you. This is who he was speaking to, and this is what it means. And Better than that, people. I want you to go more. Remember, I'm a recovering addict. More is better. That's me. More is better. So I don't want you to just clarify it for me. I want you to show me how that's going to benefit me. I want you to show me how to apply that to make my life what my life is supposed to be, to make my wife feel like she's supposed to feel, to make my family living the way that family living is supposed to be. I got more tools than Tim the Tool Man Taylor today. And sometimes I use them about as good as he does. But the majority of the time, every tool that I pull out of my toolbox, it works. You know where I get them from? I get them from you. I get them from you. I get them from each and every person in here. Do you know who knows me better than me besides God? Her. I get so much from her, it's unreal. But you see, I suffer with that false pride every now and then. I don't never give my wife enough credit that she deserves. And I don't think I'm the only man who suffers from that. I think that we suffer from this man thing. And in reality, she is the center of our home. She makes better decisions than I can ever make. She understands a lot more than what I give her credit for. And for that, I don't just thank her. I thank God. I thank God for that. People are like, dude, you found such a great wife. Let me let you know something. I didn't find her. God gave her to me. And let me tell you something. If God gave her to me, doesn't that mean she's a gift? Let me ask you this. How you treat the gifts that God gives you? Who is right? How you treat the gifts that God gives you? I want to see each and every person, man, open it up, man, with gentleness, man, and with kindness. And that's how I treat every package, especially the ones that God gave me. People, do you understand the importance of what I'm talking about? It all falls to, if it wasn't, for the parable that Jesus is talking about here, if I couldn't relate that to my life, I would not be the person that I am today. If God did not send the group of Samaritans to me, I would not be standing here It's up to us, us to stay strong, us to go do the right thing. Plant the seed. You know one of the best things that I think happened to me back then when this group came? You see, because God was there the whole time. When I'm like, God, what about me? You know what he's doing? He's sitting there the whole time with his arm out. Whole time. Just waiting for me to grab onto it. I'm like, God, if if, if God's so good, why am I living in a tent? If God's so good, why am I eating out of a dumpster? Let me tell you something. God's so good, he gave me that tent. God's so good, he put food in that dumpster for me. 
He knew I was existing. Was he smiling on me? Absolutely not. Did he ever quit and give up on me? No, he did not. What did he do? He sat there for 20 years with his hand out, waiting for me to finally say, I believe, man. Can you help me? Can you help me do something here? I'll do whatever you want. Then all of a sudden he realized, remember, he's God. I'm pretty sure he knows what he's doing. He realized, I'm not going to just go with one Samaritan. I got to see something. So he sends me a herd of Samaritans that come from the land of corn, man, at the point. And I love them just like I love everybody. That's what it took. The, the whole group came to me. Do we do that? Here's the best part. They did not come to me and tell me what I had to do. They did not come to me and tell me like everything else that I've been taught. You'll never amount to nothing. You're never going to be a success. You'll probably be dead or incarcerated for the remainder of your life. I'm tired of you embarrassing this family. Why are you such a disgrace? How many years are you going to go around trashing the Pfeiffer name? They didn't come and say any of the things that I was used to hearing. They came and they loved me. They didn't come and beat me with scripture. They came being obedient because God knows I didn't want to hear none of that because I didn't understand none of it. They came gently. They came and they took care of me. And they were part of that process to build me up for me to start understanding what the word of God really even means. A lot of us forget that. A lot of us think that our job is to go out, man, and bombard people with scripture. I would have ran. I would have. And I know many people that I work with in the outreach ministry, they would run also. Because the word of God tells me all I'm supposed to do is plant a seed. Sometimes that seed could just be to smile. Sometimes that seed could just be a, how do you do? You know what's funny? I love doing this one. Seeing somebody come out of the gas station. And I open up the door for them. And I tell them, you have a wonderful day. And I shake their hand like that. And I watch them. I don't go into the gas station. I watch them. And when they go to their car, this is what I see. <laughs> they, yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they're making sure I didn't rob him. That is, that is funny. And I still see that today, and I'm okay with that. All that tells me is I got to keep on fighting a good fight. All that tells me is that society does judge a book by its cover. All that does is tell me that in the biblical days, man, they would be looking at me as a Samaritan, as a lowlife, as a castaway. I'm doing something that I ought to not be doing. And then I tell them, you have a blessed day. This is real great. When I tell them, I'm going to pray for you. Woo! do I get some looks because I can guarantee you they're wondering and they're thinking that guy said he was going to pray for me he, he seems like he's on something I am I'm on God do you understand that I am on the Holy Spirit it is the best high I've ever had in my entire life so they're right I am on something but I'm on something on a positive note today people and then they think to themselves because I know they have to sometime throughout that day that guy said he was going to pray for me I don't know if that's good or bad <laughs> Am I going to stop doing what I do? Absolutely not. Why would I? Remember, I don't care what anybody thinks about me. Not at all. If you have a problem with anything that I say, I encourage you to open up the book, get in the Word of God, and call me and tell me what I said that was wrong. For real. I have no problem with that. If you want to see these seats get filled, I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you, man, to get out of the closet and to be who you are in here on Sundays, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. I want to encourage you to shake hands. I want to encourage you to invite people. I want you to encourage you to plant seeds. You ain't got to beat them with Scripture. Word of God says all we're supposed to do is plant a seed. That's it. If I said that that book is the book and the only book, why would we do it any different? You don't have to write nothing in there. It's already been done for us. We just have to learn about some things. Humility in service, in selflessness. I do not want to end up being like that priest and that Levite ever again and suffer from self-righteousness. Every morning for almost seven years now, 
there are two things that I ask God for every morning, and that's to keep me humble and to keep me teachable because I'm never going to know it all. And I never want to be that person that I used to be ever again. I don't. I don't do what I do to hear thank you. You want to thank somebody? Thank God. When you're done thanking God, thank that whole front row, man, for them giving my time away. That's who you thank. Don't thank me. All I'm doing is trying to fix something that I ruined for 20 years of my life. And that's a small price for me to be able to do for what Jesus did for me and for what Jesus did for everybody in here. With that, if anybody is struggling in here, I encourage you, get out of your comfort zone and ask for some help. If you don't surrender and ask for help from each other, from God, from your husband, from your wife, from your neighbor, it'll never happen. If nothing changes, nothing changes. I'm more of a man today than I've ever been in my entire life. I cry more today than I've ever cried in my entire life. I do things today that I thought men weren't even supposed to do, but remember, I didn't even know what a man was. I guarantee you, I'm a better man than I ever have been in my life, man, and I know that because God shines on me. 24 months with no income coming in that house. You know what we did get? We didn't get any foreclosure notices. We got turnoff notices, but that happens. <laughs> we still got the house. They all look healthy to me. Every single one of them. And you know what we got in those 24 months, man? It isn't the money. We got some priceless things in our family. Some things you can't buy. I don't care where you work at or what kind of salary you make, you can't go buy it. And for that, I would do those same 24 months all over again. Was it difficult? Yeah. I got news for you. Being a Christian, being a true Christian, being a true child of God, it's not easy. It's not written that we got it paved of a bunch of roses. People, it has thorns in the roses. We have bumps. We have hurdles. We have life. We live in a sick society, and we're not winning. We're not I can't wait for the day, man, that I can do cartwheels and somersaults. Somebody's got to teach me how to do them because I don't know how. But when this day comes, I'll bet you God's going to give me the ability to do it. And you know what that day is going to be? The day that I know in my heart. The day that I can ride around and say, Whoa! Praise God, we're winning! I drive around today and I weep at the things that I see. And I hurt about the things that I hear. And all it does is remind me that we're not winning and we have a long ways to go. That's my encouragement. Fight that good fight. Seven days a week, 24 hours a day, no matter where you're at. With that, it's been an honor to be able to be here with you, my brothers and sisters. And I love every single one of you.